welcome to the new session of tutors today we'll be dealing with the fourth part of the chapter morphology of flowering plants and that is morphology of flower before going to the video those who haven't subscribed to our channel subscribe to it and enable the bell icon for getting daily notification so without wasting time let's get on with the video first we have to understand the term inflorescence now have you ever thought where a flower is born, what happens to the stem? The normal stem, when it gets adapted to bear a flower, it modifies the shoot. That is, the apical meristem helps the elongation of a stem, right? So, when it is ready to bear a flower, it gets modified to a floral meristem. So, the shoot is modified. What happens is modification is that the internode in this region does not elongate and the axis gets condensed. It has nodes, but the internode does not elongate and gets condensed. Now the apex, whether that is floral apex, where flower is born, produces different kinds of floral appendages laterally at successive nodes instead of leaves. So instead of leaves, floral appendages are born. The pattern of arrangement of flower on the floral axis is known as inflorescence. Now there are two types of inflorescence. The first one is racemose inflorescence and the second one is cymose inflorescence. Now what is cymose and what is racemose inflorescence? Let's get to understand that. In racemose inflorescence, the main axis continues to grow. You, know, you can see that in this picture, this is the racemose inflorescence. This here is the main axis of the plant and this main axis continues to grow but whereas in the case of cymose inflorescence the growth is limited here the main in the cymose inflorescence main axis continues to grow but whereas in the cymose the limit growth is limited the second point here is that the flowers are born laterally so you can see in this picture the flowers are born laterally on the main axis and it is an acropetal succession acropetal succession is in which the flower, uh, younger flowers are towards the tip. Here is the younger flower and older flowers are towards the base. That's the type of arrangement. And whereas in the case of cymose inflorescence, uh, the flowers are born in basipetal succession. So basipetal succession is in where the older flowers are born towards the tip. Here this is the older flower and younger flowers are towards the base. So that's the difference. And in racemose inflorescence, it never terminates in a flower, but in cymose inflorescence, the main axis terminates in a flower. That's the difference between cymose and racemose inflorescence. I hope you understood what is cymose and racemose inflorescence is. Now, let's get to understand what is a flower. A flower, in much simpler terms, is the reproductive structure of angiosperms which helps in sexual reproduction. Now let's understand the parts of a flower. A flower has four whorls arranged successively on the thalamus. The thalamus is, uh, let's understand what the thalamus is. Suppose it's a stem and the tip portion where it is ready to bear a flower gets enlarged and swollen like this and it bears flower like this. Now this swollen portion here is termed as thalamus. Now flower has four whorls as I have mentioned before. The first one is calyx, that is the green part of the flower. The base of the flower has a green sepals that is termed as calyx. The corolla is the petal, that is the colored portion of the flower which helps in attracting the insect. The colored portion, petals are known as corolla. And the third one is andresium. The andresium is the male reproductive structure of a flower. And the fourth one is gynesium, that is the female reproductive structure of a flower. Now, when gynesium and andresium are both present in a flower, it is termed as bisexual flower. And if only one sex organ is present in the flower, is monosexual. Now, how to describe a flower? Let's understand that. So, we can describe a flower based on its symmetry. The first one is a flower may be actinomorphic. An actinomorphic flower is in which it has a radial symmetry that means we can cut the flower in any plane you can see in this picture this particular picture here this flower can be cut in any plane so that flower is said to be actinomorphic example is mustard 
Now the second one here is zygote of a flower which has a bilateral symmetry. So flowers having bilateral symmetry is said to be zygomorphic. The example is B. So in this picture, you can see here is that the flower can be put only in a single plane. So that flower is said to be zygomorphic. And the third category is asymmetric. That means a particular flower which cannot be cut in any plane. Such irregular flowers are termed as Asymmetric flowers, the example is canna. So, in this picture, in this particular picture, you can see that this flower cannot be cut in any plane. So, that flowers are said to be asymmetric flowers. Now, based on the number of floral appendages, we can say a flower may be trimerous, tetrameris, or pentrameris. When the number of floral appendages that is the number of sepals or petals are a multiple of three. It is said to be trimerous flower. That means three, six, nine, like that. So multiples of three, that is the number of sepals or petals are, are having a multiple of three, that, that flower is said to be trimerous. And when the number of floral appendages are multiple of four, it is said to be tetrameris. And when the number of floral appendages are multiple of five, it is said to be pentamerous, respectively. Now, uh, a flower with a bract is said to be bracteate flower. A bract is a reduced leaf found at the base of the flower. So this particular structure you can see is a bract. That's leaf-like structure found at the base of the flower. And the flower which does not have a bract are known as a bracteate flowers. Now we can also describe a flower based on the position of calyx, corolla, and antrician in respect to the ovary on the thalamus. The flower describing described are the first one is hypogynous flower, as the gynecium occupies the highest position. That the flower is said to be hypogynous and the ovary is said to be superior. Example master. You can see a picture then you can understand much more clearly. So in this one, this is the ovary here. You can see here is that the ovary is occupying at the superior position, top position, and the other appendages are born from below the ovary. That is the sepal is born below the ovary, the androecium is seen below the ovary, the petal is also born from the below the ovary. So that flower is said to be hypogynous flower, and the ovary of this flower is said to be superior. Now, third one, uh, second one is that perigynous flower. That is, the gynecium is situated at the center. Uh, situated at the center, and the ovary is said to be half inferior. The example is rose. So, in this picture, you can see that the ovary here is exactly the middle. That are other appendages are born from middle of the ovary. So, you can see that the calyx petals. This petals and antrecium are born from the middle of the ovary. So this flower is said to be perigynous and the ovary is said to be half inferior. Now the third one is epigynous. That is the ovary is born at the lower part. That is the thalamus grows, can, grows upward and encloses the ovary completely. And other parts of the flower arises above the ovary. That is, the ovary is in the inferior position. That is, in lower part. And other parts of the flowers, like androecium, gynecium, I'm uh, sorry, androecium, uh, calyx, and the corolla are born from above the ovary. So, such flowers are known as epigynous, and the ovary is said to be inferior. The example is cucumber. So, in this picture, you can see that. The ovaries in the lowermost position and then other floral appendages like calyx, the petals, and the androecium stamens are born from above the ovary. So in this type of ovary where the thalamus completely encloses the ovary and the ovaries in the inferior position, such flowers are known as epikinous flowers and the ovaries are said to be inferior. So let's get into the Parts of a flower. So this picture here is the lateral section of a flower, or simply LS of a flower. A flower has a green portion known as the calyx, which helps in protecting the flower at the bud stage. So
So the individual unit of a calyx is known as a sepal. It is green and leaf-like. Now the this colored portion you see here, this one is a corolla and it is brightly colored and helps in attracting insect for pollination. And the individual units of the corolla is known as petals. And the third one is the andracium. The male reproductive part of a flower is known as andracium and its individual units is known as stamen. So this here you can see here is a stamen. Now a stamen has a two parts, namely the first one is the anther, that is this enlarged portion, and it has a stalk-like thing which is known as the filament. Now the last one is the this gynecium, it is the female reproductive part of the flower. It has a basically enlarged portion known as the ovary. It has a stalk-like thing known as the style, and it has a receptive portion of the pollen grain known as the stigma. So this here I have mentioned before the calyx that is the outermost whorl of a flower and its individual unit is known as a sepal. It is green in color and protects the flower at the bud stage. So it may be gamosepalous or polysepalous. Gamosepalous means the sepals are united. So if suppose it's this individual sepal, uh, individual unit is a sepal, it may be united in this like this in case of a flower. So that condition is known as Camosepalus, and in certain other cases, the sepals may not be united, it may be free like this. So, that condition is known as the polysepalus condition, and the sepals are free. The second one is the corolla, it is brightly colored and helps to attract insect of all nation, and the individual units are known as petals. It may be uh, again as in the case of sepals it may be gamma petalis or polypetalis that means the petals are united it is known as gamma petalis and if the petals are free it is known as polypetalis now the corolla may have different shapes it may be tubular bell shaped or funnel shaped suppose the petals are gamma petalis that is the corolla is gamma petalis and uh, it is united taking the ls of a flower we can see sometimes the petals may be basically united like this to form a funnel shaped or a bell shaped or a tubular structure so this shape may be different in different flowers so according to accordingly the it is classified as tubular bell shaped or funnel shaped the arrangement of sepals or petals in the bud condition is known as deciduation so in bud condition the arrangement of the petals and sepals may be different so that arrangement is with respect to other members of the same world is known as aestivation. Now let's see the different types of aestivation. The first one is the volvate aestivation. Uh, in volvate aestivation, the sepals or petals, it means petal or sepal, uh, touch each other at the end without overlapping. So in this picture you can see that it may touch each other or may be free. Uh, in the, it, if it is gamma, condition it may touch either if it is poly it may not touch either so it does not overlap you can see in this picture it does not overlap it, it may be petals or sepals the arrangement of petals or sepals are known as uh, estuation so you can see in this volvate estuation the petals or sepals do not touch each other it does uh is sorry it does not overlap it, each other but accordingly if it is gamma it may touch each other and if it is poly it may not touch each other now the second one is twisted aestivation. In this case, the margins of sepals or petals overlap each other. So in this case, you can see here that the sepals or petals overlap each other. And in imbricate aestivation, one petal is completely in. So in this one, petal or sepal may be completely in. So here you can see that this particular petal or sepal is completely in. That is, both margins are completely covered by other two petals or sepals. And one petal or sepal may be completely out. So here you can see here that this one, this particular petal or sepal is completely out. And the other petals or sepals may be in or are in and out condition. So that may be like a twisted condition. That is one is overlapping here. This may be overlapping by this one. So in, in and out condition, that is the exact word. It is in and out condition. 
So that particular estivation is known as imbricate estivation. Now the fourth one is vexillary. In vexillary estivation, the there has a there is a large standard petal. That is this, this one here is the last standard petal, which covers two wing petals. So this thing here, this and this is the wing petal. So the last standard petal covers two wing petals, which in turn covers two keel petals. This is the two keel petals. So that type of estivation is known as vexillary estivation. So vexillary estivation is the main example is pea. Uh, in pea plants, you can see, see this vexillary estivation, and this twisted estivation is mainly seen uh, in hibiscus. You can the main example is hibiscus. So uh, that's about estivation. Now the andration, that is the male reproductive part of a flower, it is composed of stamen which represents the male reproductive organ of a flower. A stamen, as I have mentioned before, contains a filament and anther. Now each anther is bilobed and each lobe has two chambers. So let's see the diagram first. So this particular portion, this one is the anther lobe, a single anther lobe. The second one is, a, this is uh, the first one and second one. So there are two lobes and each lobe has two chambers. So this particular lobe has two chambers. This one is the first chamber and this one is the second chamber. And in this chamber pollen grains are formed. So an anther is bilobed and tetralocular. A chamber may be locule, may be called as locule. So a uh, typical Anther is bilobed and tetralocular. So, uh, two ch locules are or chambers are formed in a single uh, lobe. So, two lobes consist of four chambers. So, but generally, an anther is bilobed uh, bi and tetralocular. And now, that is a case of fertile stamen. Sometimes there is a sterile stamen which is not produced in pollen grains. Such stamen is known as staminode. Now, when a stamen is attached to a petal, that condition is known as epipetalis condition. See in this picture is this is the corolla a petal. It has a stamen attached to it. So that particular condition is known as epipetalis condition. Now when the stamen is attached to a perianth, uh, now what is a perianth? In certain flowers, there may not be differentiation between petals and sepals. Instead of that, there is a single structure known as Sepals, that individual unit is known as sepals. It looks like a petal, but it is not, not a petal or a sepal. Instead of petals or uh, petal or sepal, there is a single unit known as a sepal. So, when a stamen is attached to such a sepal, it is known as epiphyllous condition. Now, when the stamen is united, that the, all the stamens of flower is united to a one single bundle, that condition is known as monadelphic condition. The example is hibiscus. Now when the stamen is united to two bundles, that is uh, the stamens of flower are united to, to form or forms two groups or two bundles, that condition is known as diadelphous condition. The example is P. Now when the stamen is united to many bundles, more than two bundles, that condition is known as polyadelphous condition. The example is citrus. So in this picture, you can see that the stamens of a flower is united to a single bundle. So this condition is known as monadelphous condition. And when the stamen is united to two groups, so form two separate groups. So here, this here is one group, and this another is as another group. So such two bundles, then it is known as diadelphous condition. The third one, you can see that the many more than two groups. So here you can see that in this particular picture, you can see that one, two. Three, four, five groups are there. So this is a polydelphous condition. So now the next part that is the gynecium. Next part of a flower is the gynecium. The individual unit of a gynecium is known as carpal, and it is a female reproductive part of a flower. A carpal consists of three parts, namely sigma, style, and ovary. We have mentioned or and this reward is sigma cell and ovary in the first picture at the beginning. Now, the ovary is the enlarged basal portion of the carpal, which contains ovules. 
which is attached to a placenta. So in ovary, the ovules are attached to a cushion-like structure, a soft tissue is known as placenta. The style connects ovary and stigma. The stigma here is the receptive surface of pollen grains. That is, the pollen grains falls on, on the surface known as stigma of the carpel. Now, when more than one carpel is present, they may be free. That is, uh, if the carpel is present uh, in more than two or three or four, the carpel may not be united. So, such condition is known as apocarpus condition. And when in the case, the carpels are united or it is united to form a group, it is known as incarpus condition. Suppose this here is a carpel, the carpel may be free like this. It, it is not united. So this condition is apocarpus condition. And when the carpel is united to form a single group, single structure, this is known as a syncarpus condition. This is the LS of an, an ovary. Uh, so this condition where the carpels are united is known as syncarpus condition. In this case where the carpels are free, it is known as apocarpus condition. So next the term, the placentation. Placentation is the arrangement of abuse within the ovary. So there are many five types of placentation. The first one is marginal placentation. In marginal placentation, ovules are born on the placenta, but it is at the margin of the ovary. So in this picture, this is the ovary, and uh, this here is the placenta, and this is the ovule. So the ovules are born on the placenta at the margin, the margin of the ovary. So this type of placentation is known as marginal placentation. Now the next one is axile placentation. In this case, the ovules are attached to the placenta. Of course, it is attached to the placenta, but it is attached. The placenta is seen at the inner angles of the locule of a multicarpillary ovary. Multicarpillary ovary means more than two ovules. Uh, ovaries are carpels are seen. And it is in carpus condition, that is that it is attached, the carpels are attached in the condition, the inner angles of the locule, the individual locule, the placenta is seen and where ovules are born. So this here is a multi-carpillary ovary and it's in syncarpus condition and this here is the locule. So in the inner angles, is the inner angle the ovules are born. So this type of placentation is known as axile placentation. Now the third type is parietal placentation. Parietal placentation is uh, where the ovules are attached to the placenta, but the placenta is seen in the inner wall of the monocarpillary ovary. So monocarpillary means only a single carpal is there, and the inner wall of the monocarpillary ovary, ovules are seen attached to the placenta. So this here is the monocarpillary ovary and this is the inner wall of the ovary and placenta is seen at the inner wall of the ovary and ovules are attached like this. So this type of placentation is known as parietal placentation. Now the next category is free central placentation. The, the fifth one is the free central placentation. Recently, placentation is uh, where the ovules are born attached to a central axis. So the placenta is seen at more on the central axis and the ovules are attached to the central axis. So such type of placentation is known as free central placentation. So you can see that this, uh, this is central axis and you can see the ovules attached to the central axis. Uh, the ovules are attached to the uh, born on the placenta. So this type of placentation is known as a free central placentation. Now the next type is the basal placentation. In this type, the ovules develops from the base of the ovary, that is the placenta for this ovule develops from the base of the ovary and thus the ovule develops in the base of the ovary. So here you can see that this is the ovule here and uh, it is born at the base of the ovary. So this type of placentation is known as basal placentation. So that is about placentation and uh, morphology of flower. So hope you understood the 
about the morphology of flower if, or if you have any doubts or queries regarding this topic comment on the section below and let me know so thank you